In today's video, we'll take a look at the New King James Version Study Bible. This is the full color third edition. This particular copy is in brown, two-tone brown, leather soft. Let's take a quick look at the box. It's a clamshell box that's easy to open. So you can store your Bible in that with ease. Nicely decorated. There is the ISBN. And here are some of the features. 15,000 verse by verse study notes. It has Bible times and culture notes. Also it has uh, discussions of the meanings of certain terms. Lots of in-text color maps. To give you a sense for dimensions, here it is in a stack with the um, ESV Church History Study Bible, the MacArthur Study Bible, the Orthodox Study Bible, the ESV Study Bible. This is our Bible for today at the very top. From time to time in today's video, I may make reference to the second edition. When I do, it'll be this hardcover, which uh, dates back quite a, t quite a number of years. Some of you may remember a bookstore called Borders. I very much miss Borders. So in terms of dimensions, this volume is 9 and 9 sixteenths inches tall, 6 and 13 sixteenths inches wide, and it is right at 2 inches thick along the spine. By the way, those of you who are curious about the map, this is a tourist's map of London, which I picked up when I visited there in the summer of 2003 text, as you can see, is laid out in two columns in a paragraph format. Each column is 65 millimeters wide. I count around 55 characters per line on a crowded line with a lot of characters on it and fewer broad characters like M's and W's. There are as many as 61 characters, uh, I mean lines on a page in a column. There are far fewer than that here, and it varies from page to page, depending on how much study material there is. The uh, tallest column I found was on page 209, which I'll show you here. Seems to go to, from top to bottom. It could have extended farther down, but as you see, the references here are at the bottom of the text. The dimensions of the pages 233 millimeters tall, that's 9.17 inches tall. The width is 160 millimeters, that's 6.3 inches wide. We think about the margins at the top from this blue line to the edge is 10 to 12 millimeters. There are 25.4 millimeters to an inch, so that's less than half an inch. The inner margin here can be as much as 14, say at the beginning of Genesis. The outer margin ranges between 10 and 13 millimeters, so it's almost half an inch in places. And the bottom margin is quite narrow. Down here from the bottom of a descender to the edge is 6 to 8 millimeters. Uh, looking to the right here, you should be able to see that the text is line matched to the text. So the text on the opposite side of the page lines up nicely here. The headings are not line matched to the text, so they're a little bit offset. And then as you move down here, we're on the opposite side of the page, we have references. You can see that those are not line matched. The notes, as far as I can tell, are line matched to the notes. So here I'm illuminating from the back side the notes, and you can see that they're lined up nicely. In the New King James Version, as you can see, words that the translators add for smoothing that don't represent a word in the original language, in this case Greek, are put into an italic font. And in the New King James Version, pronouns for deity are capitalized. In this edition, words are not self-pronouncing, so you see no pronunciation signs over these words to tell you how to pronounce them. This is an old uh, King James Version Bible. It's an Oxford Long Primer from uh, the 1940s or so. 
And so you see the symbols that are used, how the words are broken up into syllables, and then how there are symbols used to tell you how to pronounce the vowels. Some translations use uh, Yahweh or uh, Jehovah, but um, the New King James Version uses the standard capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D to refer to the Tetragrammaton. In this edition, the words of Christ are in black ink. That's the way I prefer it. From time to time, viewers will ask me why. I've made a video on that topic. The most important reason I give in that video is that the red letters cause me eye strain. It actually hurts to read them after, a, after reading for several minutes. The headings in the text are in about a seven-point sans serif font. It's black, and it's on all caps. Underneath some of the headings, you'll find references to similar or parallel passages. That's like what was done in the New International Version. So you see the same references there in the old NIV that you see here. So the big picture is we have two columns of text on each page. And then below that, we have the references. I prefer the references in the center column myself. And then before that, in a smaller font than the text, we have the notes. This is the third full color edition that you're looking at. Now I'm gonna pull over the second edition and show you what that looked like. So here again, we had uh, two columns of text in a paragraph by paragraph format. You had center column references offset in blue, which I like. Um, the titles, the headings are different. For instance, here at 117, it says the 70 returned with joy, but in the old one, it had the return of the 70. So they've made changes there. And then as we look through the notes later, we'll see how the notes have changed, if at all. The comfort print font in the text is advertised as nine point. When I compare to Times New Roman, capital letters like that A and that G are about the same height as a Times New Roman eight point. The lowercase letters do compare favorably in height to Times New Roman nine point. The line height, baseline to baseline, is 3.33 millimeters, which uh, computes to 9.4 points, a little over 9.4. And I think it looks good. It, you seem to have enough space between the lines that you can read it without uh, overly tiring your eyes. There is some print non-uniformity or fading, but it's very rare in this edition, at least in my copy. This page looks a little bit fainter than the page that I'm going to pull over the top, but you may not be able to see the difference on the camera. This does look a bit darker here. The uh, problem or the issue may be because this particular page is printed opposite one of the notes. This is a note called the Day of Rest. The references are placed below the text, as I've mentioned a couple of times now. The font here is about seven points. You have nine points in the text, seven points here in the references. As far as I can tell, the reference set is the full set that one finds in New King James Version. And Nelson used to advertise that as 72,000. I believe this edition also includes the full set of NKJV text and translation notes. Here you see a translation note at JEET, which you will, in some editions, not find. So if we look down below, you'll see the note embedded down with the references, plunder you or take you captive. Similarly, there's a translation note here at Mark 620, where the New King James Version says, when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. If we look down below at the notes, we'll see that a more modern critical text says he was very perplexed. Each book has an introduction. The book introductions are printed largely in an eight to nine point font. It's perhaps eight, eight and a half plus. The lowercase characters were a little smaller than Times New Roman nine. 
This is the introduction to the Acts of the Apostles. So you have some general overview information and a larger font. Then you have author, date, purpose, theology, Christ and the scriptures. And then alongside here we have a timeline of the major events that are outlined in the book. And if we follow on to the next page, I can get it to turn. We have the continuation of that last topic. And then at the bottom of the page, an outline of the Book of Acts. Immediately after the introduction, the book begins. This is the way it is throughout the Bible. So here we are in 2 Corinthians. Here is the outline to 2 Corinthians. And then about a quarter of the way down the page, perhaps a third, we come to the beginning of the book. Book titles and contents. So the first verse on this left-hand page is 2 Corinthians 2.4, and page numbers are in the outside tops of the pages. This makes it easy to navigate through the Bible as you're flipping through. You don't have to open the pages very broadly, as you would say if all this information or some of it is printed here towards the middle. Chapter numbers are large, spanning about two lines. They're fairly bold, and they are in a greenish color. I believe this might be called teal. Let's talk about paper next. I measured the sheet thickness as thir at 38 and a half micrometers. So I estimate the paper weight at 35 GSM. It may be 32, it's probably around 36. There is a sheen on the surface. I have difficulty showing the sheen, but I think you can see some of it right through here. Oh, here's some on the right too. So it does reflect a bit. The color is light cream. It's very nearly white. There is show through. I do not find it distracting. You can see the word forward through the title page here. Turn the title page. So that gives you a sense for how, how much attenuation you get. We'll move along now and talk about the study material in the back. First I want to show you the sheen. I think you can see it right through there. So we're now at the end of the book of Revelation. And the next page is a table of monies, weights, and measures. A couple of pages. We have a couple of essays next. They're in an 8 to 8.5 slash 9 point font. The Bible is history. What is theology? Teachings and illustrations of Christ in that same font. We have prophecies of the Messiah fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This is a seven to seven and a half point font. It goes on for several pages. And then we have the parables of Jesus Christ printed in the same eight to nine, eight to eight and a half point font as is the miracles of Jesus Christ and the prayers of the Bible. Then we come to a section called From Biblical Book to Contemporary Hook, printed again in that same font. I'll zoom in here and let you take a look at that. This is how we go from a particular biblical book. We show a theme, the Christ focus, implications, and what they're calling a hook. So this section continues for several pages. As we said, it's in that eight to eight and a half slash nine point font. One of these entries for each book of the Bible. We then come to subject index to annotations and features. This is very useful. It's printed in a seven to 7.5 point font. There are about 570 of these entries, headings, for the, uh, for the annotations and features. Three columns, 7.5 point font, 16 pages. So this is somewhat useful, and we may use it later in order to analyze the footnotes, find a particular topic, 
and look at uh, the notes that discuss that topic to get a feel for the character of the study Bible. At the end of that section, we come to the concordance. The concordance is in that same 7 to 7.5 point font. It's in three columns. It spans 182 pages, and I estimate about 5,900 keywords. I didn't count them, but I counted them on several pages, took the average per page, and multiplied by the number of pages. So I'll let you, let you take a closer look at these entries. I've turned forward now to the end of the concordance. You have the back side of the last page, last sheet of the concordance is blank. Then you have a complete blank sheet. Then the back side of the following sheet is blank. There is a note regarding the type. And then we come to 14 color maps on this somewhat glossy paper. These maps are low detail, their color. They do not go into the gutter, so there's no geography lost in the middle of the page. 14 maps on 16 pages. Oftentimes these days Nelson Bibles have seven maps on eight pages. At the end of the maps we have a paper paste down or paste off liner. And let's take a look at the headbands and tailbands and such. So the headbands and tailbands are brown. Page edges are gold. This is one of those Bibles that you have to spend time separating the pages, fanning them apart to try to get them to separate, and perhaps sometimes twisting the pages to get them to break apart. Uh, two ribbon markers. One is red, as you see, one's black. They are 10 millimeters wide, 34 and a half centimeters long. And I think that they're long enough for use. They come out about that far at the corner. So it's easy to use from that perspective. The cover is brown leather soft. It has stitching around the edges of the page stitching between the panels. So you see two lines there. The binding was definitely sewn and you should be able to see the stitching alongside my finger there in the gutter. At the Old Testament title page, once you've broken the Bible in and separated the pages, then it lies fairly flat and open in Genesis. As you get deeper into the Bible, you'll notice a roll off into the gutter. So you'll need to flatten the page that you're reading in order to be able to have a level surface to read from. As we move into the Bible from the front, we have the same brown paste off liner. We have a presentation page, somewhat heavier in paper cardstock. You have a half title. In the full title, we've seen this page before, we looked at the word forward through it to check the opacity. This particular copy is printed in China. It is the fifth printing in 2023. There's a foreword which talks about the various materials here. the uh, different study aids that we'll see as we go forward. Table of contents of the entire study Bible on the right. Editors and contributors. Many of these people are Baptists. Some of them are fairly well-known names, like Bruce Metzger is mentioned here. Um, Daryl Bach, name I definitely have heard before. John uh, Wolverd, um, I believe he's been dead for some time number of these uh, people are no longer with us. Bruce Metzger certainly isn't. Uh, Arthur Farstad has uh, a connection to the majority text, I know. Walter Kaiser is a famous apologist, I believe. 
special abbreviations that you'll find in the notes. So this explains to you what that NU that we saw earlier means, what an M in the margin means, what an MT means, what VG and TR have to do with. There's the preface to the King, New King James Version. Several pages. How to understand what the Bible means by what it says. So, how to interpret the Bible. The books of the Old and New Testament. Again, this is a 66 book Protestant Bible. Okay, so now on the right we see articles. We have special articles in the Bible. And this is the list of them. And then we have a different kind of article called Bible Times and Culture Notes. And charts and diagrams. In-text maps. And word studies. So all these things will be inset into the text of the Bible. And then we come to the Old Testament. So let's flip back and take a look at some of those that we saw there in the contents. So under the topic of articles, this caught my eye, Job, Satan the Accuser. So we'll go look at um, page 730 and take a look at the article. And so here we are at page 730. We have an article, Satan the Accuser, and you can pause and read that if you like. These articles are in a seven to seven and a half point sans serif font. So they're uh, roughly the same size, as far as I can tell, as the footnotes. Here's the article on Satan the Accuser from the second edition. The uh, next category of notes was um, Bible times and culture notes. So after articles, we came to Bible Times and Culture Notes. Let's go forward and take a look at Chronology of Kings. That's uh, on page 491. So here we are at the Bible Times and Culture Note on Chronology of Kings on page 491. It's ongoing problem. The dating may be affected by several factors. So you can pause that and read it if you please. This is what that same entry looked like in the second edition. The third category of in-text aids was charts and diagrams. I think I'd like to go forward and look at the one in Leviticus on the feasts and sacred times of ancient Israel. It's on page 184, and so here's that table in this full-color full third edition. It gives you the events and the commemorations. So the Sabbath is, seventh day was a solemn rest from all work, the new moon, Passover, etc. And here's the same chart from the second edition, Feasts and Sacred Times of Ancient Israel. Next we see in-text maps. So let's look at the map on page 65 of Egypt. And it seems like a rather nice map. It shows quite a lot of land to the south of Egypt. Nubia and Kush, the Sahara Desert all the way down to the uh, White and Blue Niles and the Ethiopian Highlands. And it also shows international routes in red, local or regional routes in black, and then water routes, trade routes over the seas. That map of Egypt was not in the second edition. The second edition instead had this map, Joseph and his brothers. The final class of uh, in-text study aid is word studies. Let's take a look at anointed. That's on page 207 in numbers. And so it gives you the word in English, the Hebrew source. It would be Greek in the New Testament, the Strong's number, and then a brief article about it. And here's the same article in the second edition. You can see it spanned the entire page back in those days. I find this uh, harder to read than the narrower format in the third edition. And before we move on and do our font comparisons and examine the character of the notes, I wanted to show you the material at the beginning of the New Testament. There's an article thinking about the study of the New Testament by Carson and Moo. 
What about the geography of the Gospels? These are in that same eight, eight and a half slash nine point font that we've mentioned several times. Harmony of the Gospels, which is in the seven to seven and a half point font. And you come to the introduction to the book of Matthew, which is the same as format wise as we saw earlier. It begins with author and date, emphases, purposes, Christ in the scriptures. You have a timeline of events. They're saying the crucifixion happened in 30 AD. Here is another close up look at the font before we move into font comparisons. So on the right is the third edition New King James Version Study Bible with a comfort print font. On the left is the font in the second edition of the New King James Version Study Bible. And I think it's fairly obvious that the font on the right is far superior. You also have much more show through in the paper on the left. It does not appear to be line matched. On the left now you see the ESV Study Bible. This is my copy from about 2011. Now on the left I've brought in the somewhat larger font in the Orthodox Study Bible. On the left now you see the MacArthur Study Bible comfort print font. It's the New American Standard Bible comfort print versus the New King James Version's comfort print on the right. Much larger font on the left, of course. And finally on the left you see the font in the ESV Church History Study Bible. So in the interest of time I'm not going to talk about the New King James Version as a translation very much except to say that it's a modernization of the older King James Version getting rid of the archaic word endings and uh, pronouns like thou and thee. I have a number of charts that I've shown in the past that I will just flash up here on the on the screen, the translation continuum, the uh, departures from the Masoretic text, New King James Version rarely does that, the scatter plots that show that essentially the New King James Version is very much in the majority text world, so there are four of those plots. And um, if you want to uh, see more detailed comparisons, uh, details about the New King James Version presented in a comparison format, take a look at my NKJV versus ESV. Um, I believe there are two of those uh, videos that are available at my channel. And now we will take a tour, perhaps unguided, through the notes and introductions to this Bible to get a sense for its character. Um, starting here in the introduction to Genesis, where it says, after all the analysis, it's clear that Moses wrote and compiled Genesis to encourage the early Israelites. I was curious about what the notes would do with the two different accounts that one reads in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and whether the Bible would uh, reconcile them in its notes. There is this note here, God as Creator. It says the first two chapters of Genesis present two complementary accounts of creation. Um, I looked, skimmed through the notes, and I didn't see at a glance how the notes, or if the notes, reconcile the two accounts. They do say uh, they're not written in terms of modern science. Here we are in the introduction to Deuteronomy in terms of authorship. It says, through the centuries, Jews and Christians have believed that Moses wrote Deuteronomy. Uh, there has been doubt about this in the last 200 years. People have argued that the theology of the books is too advanced for the primitive state of the Israelites. But others have maintained that Moses compiled Deuteronomy and wrote most of it. They argue that Mosaic authorship is supported by the book's con consistent covenantal theology, etc. Then it goes on to say, Deuteronomy is basically the last will of Moses. The introduction to Isaiah says the internal evidence of the book of Isaiah points to one author, the prophet Isaiah. The introduction to the book of Daniel says there is no reason to doubt either that Daniel was a historical person or that he wrote the book that bears his name.
The introduction to Second Peter concludes the section on authorship by saying, from the preceding evidence, it is reasonable to maintain that Simon Peter wrote this letter, just as the letter itself asserts. Next, we will use the subject index to the annotations and features to look at some topics that interest me, one of which is baptism. We'll take a look quickly at the article on page 1770 and the chart on page 1464, beginning with the chart. The chart on page 1464 is at the beginning of Mark's Gospel. It tells you the etymology of the word baptism, defines it, tells you about different types of baptism, and um, explains how it's prefigured in the Old Testament. Different types in the scriptures are Jewish, John's personal baptism, Jesus' personal baptism, spirit baptism, Christian baptism, and baptism by fire. And spirit baptism, it says, is that by which believers are, are joined to the body of Christ. Christian, it's hard for me to read that far over to the right, particularly as the text is wrapping into the getter. Um, Christian baptism is a ceremonial act instituted by Christ that depicts a believer's union and identification with Christ. So here's the article on page 1770. We're in Ephesians chapter 4 here, and it talks about history of baptism a bit, that early Christians interpreted the meaning of baptism in various ways. It was command, uh, linked with the command to preach the gospel, and it concludes here by saying we cannot but draw from this history, the inference that in Christian baptism there was a deeper spiritual significance, I believe, than in the baptism of John, is what they're referring to there in context. While we're here in Ephesians, I just wanted to show you that there is an article on the Trinity in the Bible on the opposite page. You can freeze that, pause that, and read it if you like. So we're back in the subject index now, and it says that there is an article on the Lord's Supper on page 1452. The article about the Lord's Supper relates it to the past, present, and future. It's a time of remembrance and Eucharist that relates to the past. The Supper is a time of refreshing and communion, present. Third, the Supper is a time of recommitment and anticipation, the future. Under the topic Church, there's a word study on page 1932 and a chart on page 1902. We'll look at the chart first and then the word study. This is the chart on church leaders. Essentially, it has them under two different headings, overseers, bishops, elders, which it classes together, and deacons. And I will lift this up so that you can read what it says later on about the meaning, responsibilities, qualifications and qualifications again first from 1st Timothy 3 and then from Titus 1 the article on church is in 3rd John page 1932 gives you the Greek for it Ecclesia and it gives you the Strong's number it says it means an assembly uh, it talks about how it can be used as of a single congregation or the whole body of Christians. The um, Christians of each city, according to the overall pattern of the New Testament, were unified under one group of elders. Within the local church in the city, there were probably several assemblies or meetings of believers held in various homes. The subject of women teaching in church is of interest to a number of people. So let's take a look at the footnote at 1 Timothy 2.12. So the New King James Version at 1 Timothy 2.12 reads, And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. So at have authority over a man, we have this bold red line to indicate that's what the phrase is dealing with here. Uh, the word seems to indicate that teach is defined by the phrase have authority over a man. It seems best to understand this passage as teaching that women may exercise their spiritual gifts in a variety of ministries in the local assembly as long as these gifts are exercised under the appropriate leadership of men. Other commentators have viewed this verse as an example 
of Paul using his apostolic authority to curb the spread in Ephesus of false teaching that apparently was becoming popular among some women who had not been properly instructed. In the subject index to the annotations and features on page 2016, we see salvation, scripture, and second coming very close to each other. Let's take a look here at the article salvation on page 1678. The article on salvation is here in Romans chapter 1. It talks about the Old Testament background, a New Testament concept. Paul's concept in Romans, it says that Paul and the other authors portray Jesus Christ as the author and provider of salvation and its blessings. What are those blessings? Theologians use the terms justification, sanctification, glorification. It mentions that regeneration is closely connected to justification. It says nothing about a union with Christ, which is kind of interesting. On the topic of scripture, there was a note in the index pointing us to 2 Timothy 3.16. This is the, the note here uh, where it says that Paul teaches in this verse that, uh, what does the verse say? 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, etc. Scripture is true in all that it affirms and is completely authoritative because God is the author. Then he talks about how um, doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction, these uses, are um, th that of them only one of them is oriented to knowledge and information, that is doctrine. The other three in the list involve a change of life. Knowledge that does not change one's life is useless. So one of the entries under Second Coming is um, Interpreting Revelation, which talks about the preterist, historicist, idealist, and futurist views, then about the meaning of the thousand years, amillennial, postmillennial, and premillennial views. And then it gives more details on the pre the variety in the premillennial world and uh, ends by saying that uh, the central idea on which all these views agree is that Christ will return some point in the future. We saw earlier that there's a chart in the back called Prophecies of the Messiah Fulfilled in Jesus Christ. There's an entry here in Zechariah 12.10 where the author talks about they look on me whom they have pierced, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And this uh, subject of being pierced through the hands and the feet is fulfilled in John. So I'd like to go back to see what the note at Zechariah 12.10 says. So the note at 12.10 on the topic of me whom they, have, they pierced begins by talking about Jewish commentators who often regard this as a corporate reference to the Jews killed in the defense of Jerusalem. The Jewish Talmud views the text as referring to the Messiah who will be pierced in battle. The Messianic view is favored by the fact that Jesus was pierced with a spear after his death on the cross. So I hope you've enjoyed this overview of the New King James Study Bible, 3rd edition. That's very nice illustrations throughout. Quite a lot of commentary. Nice articles, interesting. Um, the thing I like most about it is the comfort print font and the opacity of the paper with the line matching of the text. That I think is, uh, although in all those ways, it's an improvement over the second edition, which you see here. The one thing I like about the second edition that I don't like uh, here, the second edition has center column references, which I prefer. Otherwise, I think in just about every way, the newer edition is superior. Sewn binding, uh, it was too early to tell about the quality of the leather soft cover, how it will last. But the, the print quality is very good. While we're going through, you can see things like interesting uh, map of Rome up there on the left, Paul's journeys. There's an article about Roman citizenship, one about the martyr Stephen. The print is somewhat small, uh, but it's nice and dark. 
the uh, words of Christ are in black. I know some people really prefer them to be in red. That helps them locate the, the passages that they're most interested in. But for me, from a reader's perspective, I greatly prefer this. Very nice illustrations throughout. So uh, thank you for your time, for watching this video overview of the New King James Version Study Bible. Uh, remember to like, uh, comment, uh, share it with your friends, and uh, thanks again.